Hi guys! Welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today is the story of Heli Crafts, also known as the Woodchip Murder. Yikes. The first murder conviction in Connecticut without the victim's body. Ooh. Let's go. Interestingly, this case was the inspiration for the 1996 movie Fargo. Haven't seen it, but I will. Let's start our story with Heli Crafts. Heli was born in Denmark on the 7th of July in 1947. Such a cute name, Heli. I like it. I like it a lot. Heli went on to become a flight attendant and she met her husband in 1969 at a flight convention thing and he was a pilot. Woo -woo. They married in 1979 and they went on to have three children together. They continued their careers so he was a pilot, she was a flight attendant. This meant that they weren't at home together often and they decided to employ a live-in nanny, Dawn Marie Thomas. They had settled down in Newtown, Connecticut. Is that how you say it? I think that's how you say it. <laughs> Who would have thought? Like, it's not a French case. Connecticut. It just sounds wrong when I'm saying it. Connecticut. That. Newtown. They live there. It was nice. Connecticut. Everything looked glorious from the outside in. Always does. Always does. Everything seemed hunky-dory until the 18th of November in 1986. Some good things did come out of 1986, though. A fellow flight attendant dropped Heli at home after a flight and she said that everything seemed fine. Heli was very excited that she was home and it was Thanksgiving coming up so she was excited to spend time with her family. Everything seemed okay. Normal. That evening on the 18th there was a snowstorm and all of the power then went out in the property. In the morning of the 19th of November 1986, Richard Crafts, the husband, he gets up early, wakes the children, wakes the nanny, come on pack your things, get in the car, I'm taking you to my sister's. She's got power. Okie dokie. Nothing unusual here. He wants them to be somewhere where there's power and, you know, lovely. Dawn, the live-in nanny, she's like, where's Heli? Like, where is, she, where is she? Is she coming with us? Or, you know, haven't seen her this morning? Hmm. No. Richard tells Dawn that she got up early. She, you know, she had a, they were flight attendants and pilots had their bags packed and ready to go. She had a, a work, she had to go, so she got up early and she'd already gone. She was on a flight. After dropping the kids and the nanny at his sister's house, he came back home to check if the power was on, so he says. Didn't realise the dog was in here. Might have just had a heart attack. <sighs> Later that evening, power comes back on, Richard heads over to his sister's house, he collects his children and collects the nanny and they all go back home, jobs are good and everything's okay, power, boom, boom. Still no sign of Heli, she's not there but that's not unusual, if she's gone to work and she's gone on a flight she could be gone for like a day, two days, you know, that's the lifestyle so that's not unusual that she's not there. However, it's not long before friends, colleagues, start calling Richard to ask where Heli is because whoa whoa whoa, surprise surprise, she did not turn up to work. Hmm. Richard tells most of her friends and colleagues that she is off in Denmark. She had to quickly go, she had to quickly go and fly to Denmark and take care of her really sick mother. This is where it gets fishy. I mean, this is just so suspicious. He's such a fool. He just tells different people different stories. So he starts telling other people, like maybe neighbors or whatever. Oh no, like not like nothing to do with like Denmark and a sick mum. He tells them that she's gone on holiday with friends to the Canary Islands. It's like, what are you doing? Think about it. Rule 101 is like, get your story straight, isn't it? Mm. Get your story straight, man. Where is she, Richard? Denmark or the Canary Islands? Ooh. Sometimes he would just tell people that he didn't know where she was. Just foolish. So let's have a little rewind. 
what could possibly make happy couple, happy husband situation end up in a missing person's case, you ask? Well, I'm going to tell you now. Things were not as they seemed. Richard, turns out, the naughty, naughty man, he had been having marital affairs is that what you say or just affairs he was having affairs since 1985 yes he could not keep it in his pants so from the sounds of it there was numerous women not just like one or two cheated on her a lot it seems like it got to a point where heli was really fed up with it now so she contacted a divorce lawyer she was like, I want, I don't know why I said it so like ex exaggerated, a divorce lawyer. She contacted a divorce lawyer and she was like, you know, I'm, I'm done. I think it was just like, she would had enough and she was just not into it anymore. And I mean, like you would, it's not great, is it? This divorce lawyer said, I think that you should get a private detective. No, a, a PI, what's that? A private investigator to follow your husband and let's get some evidence of this because I think when you get a divorce I think you need like grounds don't you for divorce because it's a legal thing enter Keith Mayo dun, dun. now Keith he started to follow Richard this is his job find the dirt and it really didn't take long because he was being a dirty dog so he had loads of pictures he took pictures of Richard meeting another woman smoochings going on, hugging, like obviously romantic, nice. And then he had to show Ellie what he'd found, really, really devastated. And she decided that she was gonna go ahead with her divorce. This is what she wanted. Richard, on the other hand, he was having none of it. He wanted his cake and eating it. He was like, you're not leaving me and I will do what the hell I like. Peace on it. So he refused to sign her divorce papers. He just ignored it, like it just wasn't happening. It just, oh, like horrible. Helly had been nervous to approach Richard about a divorce, hand him the papers, whatever. She was really nervous about that because Richard had a very volatile temper. He sounds lovely, doesn't he? Cheers. She had said to friends, quote, if something happens to me, don't think it was an accident. Well, okay. So his temper must have been real. What a way to live. Cheated on and just in the back of your mind, kind of knowing that he, he could really hurt you. That's grim. It happens a lot, it's sad. Because her friends and colleagues knew this information, his temper and the fact that she said, you know, if there was an accident, don't think it was an accident. They were concerned. And after a few days, they reported her missing. They weren't buying the Denmark Canary Islands don't know situation. At this point, Richard is taken in for questioning. Obviously, it's her husband. And the douchebag just says, well, I don't know where she is. I don't know. So he went with that one. I don't know. I don't know. She just left. She just left me. Shut up. They were like, well, okay, why did you tell her friends that she was in Denmark with, this, with her sick mother? If you don't know, don't know where she is, why would you make up a story like that? Why would you lie? And he was like, because I was embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. I didn't want everyone to know that our relationship was like falling apart at the seams. I didn't want them to know that she'd walked out on me. So I told them that she was in Denmark. Liar! Now this blows my tiny mind. He then took a lie detector because they do that quite a lot, don't they? Like, mm, are you willing to take a lie detector? I imagine if they said no, it's like, uh oh, you know, so, and then they do it and then they, you know, if they're guilty, they're guilty and they find out. But they are dodgy, I think, these lie detectors because in this case, he passed. <gasps> well, maybe she did just up and leave him then. At this point, the police, they look into her, Heli's um, telephone records and credit card records, and there is no activity after the day she's gone missing. Now, if she's just up and left and just walked out on her husband and her family, she would use her phone and she would use her credit cards. She would. So 
That's very suspicious. They also have no further evidence of what happened to her, so it's very frustrating at this point. Where is she? This is when they interview Dawn Thomas, the live-in nanny, remember? Now, this is spicy as hell because she divulges some information and you're like, whoa, I'm hard. She looks back to the morning of the 18th of November and she thinks, it was odd. It was odd. He rushed us all up, got us all up and was very quick and eager to get us all out of the house. Why? Hmm. So she's thinking now, cogs are turning. When they returned to the house, she saw a dark stain on the master bedroom carpet. Right? Now, she asked about this. She asked Richard, oh, what's happened in there? What's happened to the carpet? And he said it was a kerosene heater had spilled. I think that's a gas heater, I think. So that is massively suspicious, isn't it? Oh, what? Also, she noticed the following day, when they've all come home, that the freezer in the garage is missing. It's just gone. All of this just threw all of their suspicion back onto Richard. I think when he passed his lie detector, they were like, oh, okay, we'll look in another direction. But no, now they're right back with the spotlight on Richard, 100%. They questioned Richard again about the carpet and the freezer. And he says that it was the kerosene heater it's, it's spilt and that he cut this patch of carpet out of the bedroom and he'd taken it to like the landfill. And they're huge, aren't they? Like massive, like big, like rubbish dumps. So do you remember Keith Mayo? He was the PI for Heli. Now he just was like, yeah, you are involved, Richard. He strongly suspected Richard. So he takes himself, when he hears about the carpet, he takes himself down to the landfill, this PI. Lovely. So he's down there and it took him all day. And then eventually he, f he found the piece of carpet. Oh my gosh. Sounds great, doesn't it? But hold on to your hats, loves, because no, it's not. The testing is done. So it's taken to the police and the forensics test it. And it turns out that the stain is not blood, as we were all thinking. It is in fact kerosene. So that was the truth. There was a, a, a spillage and that's what happened. And it's like, okay, now he's passed the lie detector. This was kerosene. It's all looking bad, but maybe it's just one of those things. And maybe it wasn't him that has anything to do with this disappearance. Maybe she did just walk out. They also look into Richard's financial records at the same time, because they're investigating him. On the day that Heli went missing, he purchased new bedding. Hmm. Again, this seems suspicious, but he passed his lie detector and the, the carpet was kerosene. Okay, fine, fine, fine. So yeah, I mean, people buy bedding, don't they? He bought pillows, duvet, whatever other works. Bought new bedding on the day that Heli went missing. Okie dokes. He also purchased, rented, I should say, a U-Haul van and a wood chipper. Don't watch this one near tea time. In light of this, the police felt that they had enough evidence to obtain a search warrant, which they did, for Richard's property. On Christmas Day in 1986, they went to the property to search it. The family weren't there, he'd taken them on holiday somewhere, so they could get busy searching Richard's house. They found a king-size mattress, like standing up in a room, and on that mattress was dark staining. So they cut part of the mattress out, took it for testing and what do you know dna testing and things like that was in its infancy at this time but they could determine that it was o type female blood and what blood type do you think heli was you got it the like pattern of the blood stain on the mattress was indicating splatter rather than like a big big old blob of stain so it would it suggested blunt force trauma so like somebody had been hit hard and the blood had spattered the biggest breakthrough in this case came on the 29th of december so because of the police presence a man called joseph hein came forwards now he said that on the evening of the 19th of november he was clearing the roads 
there was that massive snowstorm wasn't there so he was clearing the roads and he worked through the night and he noticed a man with a wood chipper like what late night wood chipping he saw this man again a second time at about 5 a.m and this time he noticed that he was pointing the wood chipper towards the lake lake zor what a cool name for a lake he came forward and you know, he thought this was unusual but you know and he identified that man as richard what are you doing richard Joseph Hine took the police to the location where he had seen Richard and the wood chipper and they began their search and what they found was gross. There were thousands of wood chips and the police had to go through all of these. They found over 2,600 blonde hairs. They found tissue, human tissue. They found a toe with the toenail with the pink nail varnish on it. They found part of a tooth with the crown still attached and they found the tip of a finger. Mm. All in all, they found three ounces of remains. They also found a blue-green fabric along the lakeside and a chainsaw at the bottom of the lake. Now, all of these were tested and it was found that these body parts did belong to Heli. The chainsaw also had flesh and things that belonged to Heli on it as well. The chainsaw had a serial number that someone had tried to remove, like this. However, they did manage to recover the serial number and they traced it to a shop and they asked who purchased this chainsaw and what do you know, it was Richard, the shite. And so on the 13th of January 1987, Richard was arrested. Didn't go quite to plan. The police arrived at his address and he just wouldn't let them in. He, he refused. He was like, mm hmm, just acted like they weren't even there. But because he had three young children at home and the nanny, the police didn't want to push it too much. They didn't want to exasperate Richard into doing anything silly or harmful to the children, to the nanny. So they just waited and eventually he did come out and was taken to jail. He pleaded not guilty probably thinking because there was nobody technically oh only parts of it that he would get away with murder how wrong he was they couldn't have his trial in Newtown because there was just too many everybody knew them everybody knew about the case they needed an unbiased jury so the trial was held in New London in 1988 the trial took four months in the trial the prosecution laid out what they believed was a timeline of events. Very difficult without a body of the victim to really know what the cause of death was and what went on. A body is normally a very vital and important piece of evidence in a murder case and they didn't have that. But nevertheless, this is what they believed happened that night. Helly got the children ready for bed for about eight o'clock as she usually did if she was at home. She then got changed for bed and put on her favourite nightgown, the green and the blue material that they found at the lake. That was part of her favourite nightgown. The couple, Richard and Helly, then got into an argument about the divorce. The divorce that Richard was adamant wasn't going to happen and that Helly really wanted. This is what they speculated. In a fit of rage, they say that Richard took a large object possibly a hammer or a torch and hit Heli over the head more than once. This caused the blood spatter that they found on the mattress. When he realised that Heli was dead, he put her body in the freezer in the garage and she was there for quite a long time. He took the children and his live-in nanny to his sister's house in the morning. On his way back, he purchased the chainsaw and rented the wood chipper and the U-Haul truck. He loaded her body, possibly the freezer, which was missing, into the U-Haul van, went to the lakeside late at night, dismembered her body and put it through the wood chipper into the lake. Unfortunately, after 17 days of deliberation, the jury could not agree on a verdict. 
everybody apart from one juror agreed that he was guilty as hell and this one juror just he was like no and and he or she i'm not sure they didn't agree at all and they ended up walking out they ended up leaving and that was that and because of that the judge had to say it was a mistrial so there was a second trial this was in 1989 new jury new place let's get on with it this trial went on for two and a half months and on the 21st of november in 1989 they found him guilty when it was announced that the jury had found him guilty he showed no emotion he has maintained his innocence and really recently in january of 2020 he was released from prison so at 83 84 he is a free man yeah he got let out early for good behavior he served 30 odd years out of a 50 year sentence what do you think firstly i think he, he did do it the remains were identified as helis he was identified as a man putting that through the wood chipper and um yeah the blood spatter on the bed it all adds up and secondly when people do these things what is like the the thought process about what's going to happen next do you know what i mean like chris watts when he like annihilated his his, his whole family did he not think mm, people are going to miss them oh i better come up with a really good story about where they've gone or blah, blah, blah. not just i don't know okay but like richard what like have a story they haven't fought further than like today it's it's yeah they're not the brightest of sparks are they but thank god we don't want many people like that that commit murder and then just like geniusly get away with it no and they never found the fridge they never found the freezer ever so where did that go some poor person bought that on gumtree oh no oh my word it's probably at the bottom of some lake or something maybe they just never found it who knows anyhow new favorite pen thank you for joining me today for another episode of Cinetonic. slightly grisly case today you won't believe what i've got for dinner tonight either <laughs> last time it was like a mm, bit of a gross case i had this for dinner meatballs it's like what do i do to myself i will enjoy it though i'm trying to lose weight so every meal is precious thank you so much for joining me today i hope you can join me next week for another true crime story and a glass mug jug of gin bye